So I am so honored to be able to present Anne. I got to meet her in a Death with Dignity chat on Twitter, and she had such a powerful, amazing voice. I said, oh, I want you to join the gallery, and we're having this amazing event in Kansas City, and you got to be there because you're from Kansas City. So she totally said yes, and so she's with us today. She's going to be our first speaker, and then she will be followed by Bart. So give a big hand of applause for Anne. Thank you. Um, I'm staying away from that because I like to move around and the fabulous tech people found me a microphone that I don't have to hold on to, which is awesome because I talk with my hands. Um, first of all, I just want to congratulate all of you on being brave enough to be at this session. Anytime that we talk about dying in a presentation title, um, we sort of scare the crowds away. <laughs> So thanks for, for not being scared. Um, let me tell you a little bit about why I'm here and my story. Um, my experience with this and the reason why I'm a 30-something talking about dying is that I almost did that when I was 28 um, because I had preeclampsia as a condition of my polycystic ovarian. My son, Orion, did die during that. So we learned a lot about the fact that grieving people shouldn't have to make decisions because you're sort of incapable of making decisions. And we hadn't done any end of life planning for our, our unborn child because that's bass backwards. Um, it did, however, make me very passionate about the fact that people who are grieving should have some kind of protection against having to make lots of choices then. Um, and you know, when I watched my husband's family, because they've had most of the family die in the last 10 years, lot, all the grandparents, aunts, um, they're, they're disappearing quickly. None of them did this stuff. And so I watched my mother-in-law over and over make decisions because there was no will. There was no advanced directive. And I watched my father-in-law just freeze and fade. Um, and what I thought when I was watching that, and at the, at the last one when I was watching my husband's grandmother, who had a terminal stroke. There was no brain function after her stroke but she was terrified of a DNR because she thought it would mean that people didn't take care of her, so she wouldn't sign one. So she had a terminal stroke, but she was resuscitated, and she spent a week without any brain function, apparently in pain, because she cried a lot um, in, in an ICU. And not only did she have that time and that pain, my mother-in-law had to decide to let her mom die. She had to look at, at the medical providers and say, turn off those machines. And even though we knew she was gone, that's still a decision that we could have we skipped that. It would have been great. Um, my jacket is called Simply Grief. Um, and I will do the, the traditional now turn around. And it does a great job of talking about end of life stuff. It also for me is a fabulous description of what I do because I'm a psychologist and I work with patients and caregivers that are coping with serious illness. And so Regina did an excellent job of depicting not only what everyone who's grieving needs, which is that space and that being held, but also exactly the way that I think about therapy. So that's why I'm here. Um, the last thing on the slide is the hashtag EOL chat. That is a Tuesday night healthcare chat that I moderate that does exactly what we're doing here. We try every week to gather people together to talk about the fact that this is a conversation we're not having, and that we need to have it, and we talk about how to reduce the barriers to 
encouraging this conversation. So I said that we are not talking about end of life. Um, and the reasons for that are many, many. You know, we're scared of it. It's really uncomfortable. Most of the time, if you're talking about end of life, you're talking about loss and grief. Um, if you've been with someone who died, that could alternately be a really beautiful experience or a really terrifying experience, depending on the setting and, and the process that they went through. Um, there's a lot of alphabet soup around dying. Is it a DNR? Is it an advanced directive? Do you have a healthcare POA? You know, people get lost in the language. And so we just don't have the conversation. Um, the reasons why we're not doing this are way longer than I'm going to get into with somebody else to share the hour with. But I think any of you probably knows at least a couple of them. And you've probably lived a couple of them. Um, so I'm going to spend the bulk of my time talking about why we should. Oh, there we go. Um, ultimately, life is one of those conditions that has a 100% mortality rate. One way or another, we are guaranteed of nothing except the fact that sometime we're going to die. It could be before we ever get born. It could be in a car accident when we're 21. It could be when we're 95. Because we don't know, because we do not get a guarantee, that means that this is something we need to talk about. We need to sit down with our families. In my perfect world, this is a conversation that we are having regularly, once a year. And we need to talk about what do we mean when we are talking about end of life? Are you talking about old age? Are you talking about an accident? Are you what, what does that even mean to us? Um, we need to talk about things like finances, which is another reason that people avoid this because families and finances get emotional and ugly quickly. Um, but we need to talk about it. We need to talk about who's going to make decisions and who's going to follow those decisions. Um, you know, we need to sit down and say, this is what my ideal end of life looks like. And I know from the EOL chat that I have had people say, you know, I told my family what my ideal end of life looks like and they hate my ideal end of life. <laughs> they think it's a terrible plan and they want me to be really medically proactive. And I say to them, okay, that was the first conversation. This is why it's not a one-time deal. This is why we need to start early and talk often and make it a routine part of our conversations because when you are talking about someone that you love, that reflexive instinct, our, our knee-jerk reaction is do everything. I love them, I'm going to miss them, do everything. But we say that without knowing what do everything means. We say that without understanding that sometimes do everything means that you've had a catastrophic stroke and your brain is not functioning anymore. So doing everything just creates this horrible, painful, prolonged situation. Actually not where we want to go with the people that we love. So there are resources that will help you with this. Um, this is not something that you have to just make up on your own and jump into. Um, I actually have a takeaway paper handout because I am not 100% digital fluid, digitally fluent, thank you. Um, I can tweet with the best of them, but when it comes to slide creation and slide sharing, this is not my comfort zone. So I have a paper handout um, that you are welcome to have uh, that actually lists some of my favorite resources for having these conversations. One thing that really excites me about this time and this space is that the conversation is slowly 
shifting. And when we started talking about creating designated time for doctors to talk to patients about end of life, there was this terrible flurry of death panels, death panels, you know, with the language making everyone terrified. We're finally starting to see in the mainstream media, Rock Center just did a piece this week um, about a hospital in La Crosse, Wisconsin, that regularly, as part of their intake procedures with patients, sits down with patients and families in what they call their Next Steps program, which I love because there's nothing scary about Next Steps. Um, and they ask incredibly detailed questions that go to the heart of this. Questions like, what does a good day mean? How do you know when you're not having good days? You know, what does do everything, they take that whole do everything and say, okay, but that means this, do you want this? And that means this, do you want this? And it's a long, assessment, and if you listen to the patients in, in the Rock Center piece, they said it was a really hard conversation. But then they featured a couple that had been married for 20 years that was dealing with an inop inoperable lung cancer. And what I was really excited about was the fact that that couple was saying exactly what we've been saying in these EOL chat group conversations for two years answering those questions, refocus them on what they love about each other. It reminded them that life is short and they have to prioritize what matters. And their children were saying, it's such a relief to know what dad wants because that way we are empowered. These are a few of the resources that are in the paper hand out, we're empowered to do what he wants. So by having a conversation about death and dying, which on the surface people kind of recoil from and say, ooh, that's morbid, you are actually choosing to affirm your life, to focus on what matters, to take care of the people who love you by letting them not make painful decisions by letting them never have to say, yeah, go ahead and let my mom die. So those are the reasons that I am passionate about this. And if you catch me one on one, I will talk your ear off about why you should do this. In fact, if you want to show up Tuesday nights, um, these are all the fabulous people that provided me images because I wanted to give them credit. Um, but if you show up Tuesday nights, we will be thrilled to have you. If you don't know how to do a healthcare tweet chat, catch me afterwards because I do Twitter tutorials now because I wish that someone had given me one. Um, and, and start the conversation. Um, the handout that I do have for you has all of this stuff, a couple more questions because the first thing that you'll need is some knowledge about yourself. You have to know what you want before you can tell other people.